What I'd like to do first, to, this week is really about pushing you in that area of understanding abstract vector spaces. Really doing it from the Broquette notation, really getting what we're meaning when we go to abstract vector spaces. And I want to kind of set up real quickly now everything we've done to get us there. So we actually started with the Taylor series. And for that, I can write the Taylor series this way. If I'm going about zero, just to make it easy. And we have an interesting structure here now. I have my function f of x, which I'm going to call my abstract object. The function might be defined, I might call it sine of x, I might call it Legendre polynomial, I might call it e to the x times 1 plus x squared, whatever function of x I want. Now I'm writing it in terms of coefficients that I would call a sub n times a basis where my basis is x to the n. So I am taking some abstract general function and I'm basically writing it in component notation. That's what a series expansion does for me. And I could write this very abstractly as f of x equals the sum over n equals 0 to infinity a sub n ket n. And my ket n's are just the x to the n. And my a sub n are as defined up there. And I might find for a particular function, for instance, you might discover that only three of these a sub n are big. Maybe only three of them are non-zero. And this is a really nice representation for f of x because it's a simpler one. I only have to keep track of these coefficients. That's one of the things we gain by doing this. Now, building on that, the next thing we did was we looked at geometric vectors. And because they're easy to draw, we'll stick in the xy plane. But again, we talked about this vector now as my abstract object, keeping in mind that the vector v existed independent of any coordinate system. It is just some direction and magnitude in space. Maybe it's a velocity, maybe it's a displacement, maybe it's a force, but it's some object. It's key defining characteristics where it's direction and magnitude, but it just existed. <coughs> Once I picked a basis, I could give it a particular representation. So another way to think about these expansions is that they are representations of my abstract object. They are a concrete way to get numerical coefficients that I can compute stuff with, whatever I might be interested in computing. So what I want to do now, oh, and then, and then the third piece we did is we said, well, one of the things we want to do with these abstract, op uh, abstract objects is change them. So we talked about operators that acted on our vectors. And we saw that for particular operators, we could get a very nice basis by using the eigenvectors. So that kind of brought all of this stuff together. And underlying all of it, if we're going to do quantum mechanics, if we're going to do physics, the relevant operators are Hermitian. The relative things are complex numbers. So understanding complex algebra, how to manipulate i, take square roots of i, do all that good stuff, think about phase, was relevant. So this is why we're already interweaving the topics we've done, series, complex numbers, vectors, matrices, eigenvalues, eigenvectors. And we're going to and bring it all together now. 
So I want to reformulate these ideas now in kind of the abstract mathematics terms, just to give you some definitions. So we did write this down at one point, but recall our definition of a linear operator. Anyone re and we're going to call the linear operator L, and it's acting on objects A and B, and we'll talk about scalars C. So if I have this linear operator, what are the two main things that define it? Okay, so the first is the way it deals with scalar multiplication. And, the and what's that? So L acting on A plus B is the same as L on A plus L on B. So that is all we need to do to define our linear operators. That's our abstract definition of them. Now, for a linear vector space, and this is something we're going to practice on Thursday and you're going to practice in your homework. I'm, I'm going to do a little bit today. There are basically four things we need to do to define a linear vector space of objects, we'll call them A, B, and C that are vectors. And again, we'll have scalars that I'll call little c. So for a linear vector space, there's basically four things we need. What are they? The zero vector has to exist. Yeah, but before we can talk about a zero vector, what's the first thing we need? We're not going to use a basis. We're not going to use a coordinates. That's the last. We don't even need that for vector space, apparently, it oh, turns out. A plus B. We need our rule for addition such that a plus b equals c. And they're all in the vector space. This is critical. From an abstract math point of view, this addition, quote unquote, could be multiplication. This addition could be integrate. This addition, this addition can be any operation that when you do it with the two vectors, gives you another vector back, right? If you think about geometric vector addition, it's not normal addition. It says connect the head of one vector to the tail of the other vector and then draw a line from the tail to the head. That is a rule for addition that really isn't addition, right? It's not 2 plus 3 equals 5. It's something different. But it's a rule for addition that when you do it, you get another vector. And it has the following properties, one of which is that we have a zero vector. So zero plus a equals a. There's two more rules we have. What are they? We need to know how to multiply by our scalar. how CA gives us B. Again, notice for geometric vectors, this is not normal multiplication. This says you take the length of A and you increase it by the factor of C, and if C is negative, you flip the direction by 180. That's a rule for multiplication by a scalar. That's not necessarily the general generic multiplication. And I need one more. One more thing about my vector space I need to tell you. I need to define my additive inverse, which we call minus a, such that a plus a negative a equals 0, or a minus a equals 0. So I need to define this additive inverse, which for geometric vectors is the vector of the same magnitude 180 degrees away. Again, notice I, de I define it in a particular way. You're so used to using geometric vectors, you don't realize that it's a weird addition. But it is. But you do component addition so much, which looks like normal addition, you forget that. Notice, this is all I need. This is a linear vector space. What obvious thing is missing? Basis, 
components, dot product, they are not part of vector spaces. Mathematically, this is all I need for a linear vector space. If I add dot product, that's a special type of vector space. And that's the other thing we're going to add. So we did linear operator, we did linear vector space, and now we add the scalar or dot product. Now in this class, we don't worry too much about its formal definition, but again, it has, just like with linear vector space and linear operators, it has some formal things. It's what we call bilinear in the vectors A and B. So that means A acting on, let's call it, let's see, little b times b plus little t c times c equals b a b plus c a c. So this is what it means to be bilinear, right? There's two vectors here. It's basically the associative and property, right? No distributive property. Right, so I've, I've built in a bunch of things into this. A on B plus C is AB plus AC, but the scalar multiplication works. Okay, and it also works if I had A plus B over here on C. That works. Um, the other piece it needs to be is if we're using complex vectors, then when I flip the order, I do need to take the complex conjugate. With real vectors, I don't have to worry about that. Okay, a dot b equals b dot a. But, and normally with the bronquette notation, I would drop the arrows. But I'm just putting them here to be extra careful. Partly because my capital C and lowercase c sometimes look the same. <laughs> so we'll, we'll be using these properties of it. Again, less worried about that, yeah? What was that? So what it means is if I have the vector, let's just do a quick example. So let's suppose the vector A is um, 1 comma I, and the vector B is, I don't know, I comma 2, okay? Then the bra A, we have to worry about the complex conjugate. And so if I do A, B, that's 1 minus I times I2, which is I minus 2I. Did I do that right? Which is minus I. Now, that's A, B. Notice B times A is minus I2 times 1I, which is minus I plus 2I, which equals I, which equals AB times the complex conjugate. Complex conjugate of I is minus I. So to make Basically what happens is to make this fact be true, which is what I require for the scalar product, it's just a definition of it, that makes this have to happen. That when I make a bra out of a ket, I need to do the complex conjugate to define my scalar multiplication. So that's why AB is that. And if you think row and columns, columns are the original vector. When I make it a row, I need to do a complex conjugate. And that's something you'll have to do by hand in Mathematica, because Mathematica doesn't know that feature of the dot product. So if you just did A dot B, you wouldn't get the right answer if you had complex numbers. Now the final piece of all of this is the idea of a representation. And this is the idea by which we take a vector and we make it a column of numbers and we take an operator and we make it a matrix. And this is something we can only do when the vector spaces are finite dimension. And this requires a basis 
So it requires the idea of linearly independent. That's all it really needs is the basis and linearly independent and then we can do this. But it is much easier and it makes a lot more sense when we add the scalar product so that we can use the idea of projection because then the components become more natural. They're the projections onto the basis vectors and then it's easier to understand. And this is a lot of what we're going to spend some more time reviewing. We've done it, but I think it's new enough to do it at least twice in this class from different perspectives is really going to help. So that's the overview abstract summary of what the last chapters and this next few chapters is about.